in the course of its rise, the Chinese communists had to absorb three major defeats. And each of these setbacks ultimately led to radical innovations uh, in its approach to the revolution, in its approach to the war. And uh, in each of these defeats, Mao eventually emerged victorious as a leading architect of the new line. The first setback came in 1927, when there was a massacre of the Chinese communists, and that was followed by the uh, end of the First United Front. After that, there was the, the Mao adopted the policy of the uh, uh, agrarian revolution. The second defeat came after the destruction of the Kiangxi Soviet uh, on the Qingkangshan mountain. That led to the Long March, of course, and the Chinese party realized the need for anti-Japanese war. And the third uh, setback came uh, while they had been fighting the Japanese during the anti-Japanese war. There were major setbacks, and that was followed by the adoption of mass line, which again, of which again Mao was the architect. Now, from the beginning of 1940, the whole of North China was faced with terrible military and economic crisis. The whole area, the insurgent base area, these were blockaded by the Japanese troops. And it was very difficult to get salt and other essential goods from outside. There was scarcity of essential goods inside the base areas. And a time came when uh, people started to feel whether such revolution would at all be successful. So there was faltering within the ranks of the CPC. And there were also criticism of the policy of the new democratic revolution. Uh, and that came also from inside the party. And at that critical juncture, Mao initiated the rectification movement, which is also known in Chinese as a Cheng Feng movement. And the period was 1942 to 1944. Now the Cheng Feng movement essentially was a uh, cadre training program. It marked a turning point in the history of the Chinese Communist movement. In fact, the main aim of the Cheng Feng was to build the Chinese Communist Party on a unified basis, committed to common goals, common aims, and common methods. It was a Marxist movement, no doubt. But side by side, the emphasis was on the creative application of Marxism to the concrete situation in China, rather than any mechanical application of it. You should have the party emphasize the fact that it should be not applied mechanically, but it should be applied in a creative manner. Now, one of the fundamental aspects of Mao Zedong thought was the belief that men could transcend the limitations of class. If a person came from middle class background, when he went to the countryside to integrate uh, himself with the, uh, himself or herself with the peasantry. Then in course of social practice, in course of the, of his integration with the people living in the villages, he gets declassed, he remolds his outlook and he transcends the limitations of his own class. Now, uh, that was of course uh, uh, one major uh, object which Mao had in his mind during this period. And as a matter of fact, uh, the situation was very grave from the point of view of revolution because there were attacks from all sides and every day there were many casualties, many people died. And so the pressures from the enemy increased with every passing day. And there was, of course, a tendency to waver, tendency to capitulate before the enemy. So these tendencies were there. Now, the aim of this Cheng Feng movement was to strengthen the party cadres so that uh, in the face of hardships, in the face of enemy attacks, they uh, could stand firm on their own feet and face the enemy. And there should also be broadening of their commitment to the revolutionary cause. One point is this, during the anti-Japanese war, many patriotic people came, people who did not come earlier, 
people who did not join the communist party but who came to the countryside when when because they they realized that it was high time that they should fight unitedly against the foreign enemy now now when there would be the end of anti japanese war after the defeat of japan what would happen now should those people who came to yenan fame came to the countryside to join the forces against japan again go back to the cities or should they continue to stay back in the villages and pursue a new form of struggle that is an agrarian revolution this time against a new enemy that is chiang kai shek and the kuomintang against the bourgeoisie that was the question now the aim of the cheng feng was to broaden their outlook so that they could look beyond anti japanese struggle and they could also uh join this struggle against a new enemy that is the kuomintang that is the feudal forces so the aim of the cheng feng was to politically unify them uh do something educate them so that they became politically mature politically conscious and so they could also think beyond anti japanese struggle now mao held that the cheng feng movement was a successful method to resolve problems uh, he wrote an important essay on the correct handling of contradictions among the people at that time and there he said that the method of unity criticism unity was the most democratic method whenever any comrade committed some errors one has to rectify his mistake one has to help him rectify his mistakes so the need was to start with the object of unity and then there would be discussion ideological struggle and there was of course there would be pressure on the erring comrade but the aim would be to forge a new unity on a new basis not to uh, get rid of him not to expel him from the party or from any any forum but the aim would be to help him rectify his mistakes and so that he could be ideologically unified he could be strengthened from the ideological point of view so that party could be more uh, on a, more coherent and it is pertinent to point out that mao had been adopting these methods at a time these methods of persuasion at a time when stalin in the soviet union failed to make any distinction between the people and the enemy in the process he liquidated a large number of revolutionaries people who had pro revolution who were not enemies definitely so in this sense uh, the cheng feng method adopted by mao was clearly a departure from the line adopted by stalin in a different country of course and uh, uh there was side by side there was an educational program also newer and newer texts were suggested for reading and within the texts were included mao's own contradiction and practice both of which were regarded as mao's original contribution to marxism leninism philosophical contributions to marxism leninism now closely tied up with the cheng feng was another movement known as the cia siang or to the village movement cadets and students went to the countryside to assist the peasants during the harvesting season this was uh, one aspect of the cia siang and it continued but soon new elements were added to it it was in the spring of 1942 in the context of the rectification movement that is the cheng feng movement that the second and a critical phase of the cia siang started preparatory to their assignment in the countryside students and intellectuals they studied in yenan yenan was a center revolutionary center in shenzi northern shenzi and the aim was to train those students in yenan uh, so that uh they could have a prior assimilation of the new goals they could have a clear idea of what they are they are going to do and the main aim was to overcome the mutual prejudice and ignorance of intellectuals and peasants towards one another through sharing a common experience that is people who came from the cities to the countryside they were not at all acquainted with the problems in the villages they only did mental labor not physical labor 
they hardly took part in economic struggle for economic struggle for production or class struggle hardly on the other hand the peasants since they could not read and write they were illiterate so they could not do scientific experiments but they definitely took part in class struggle and economic and struggle for production so when these two sections of people uh, came together there was a process of uh, learning started from both sides both of them had something to learn from both and in this way the gap the three great differences which marx pointed out that particularly uh, the third one that is the difference between mental labor and physical labor, apart from town and country and worker and peasant it came to be reduced because who did not take part in mental labor now could take part in mental labor when he became literate on the other hand the town dwelling people did not take part in physical labor but now when they came to enan they had to take part in production tilling the soil etc various types of productive work so they also learned something so in this way they kept so sing is one single person now was doing both physical labor and and mental labor both the people so in this way the difference came to be minimized there was a reduction in the difference between mental labor and physical labor now the sia siang had another important uh, element related to culture the people who came from the cities uh, they were educated people they were intellectuals most of them and uh, there were many artists writers uh, so when they came they started writing in a way that reflected the aspirations of the peasants they reflected day to day struggle of the peasants they reflected the anti japanese struggles which all of them had been waging so we have the we have the emergence of new poems new novels new short stories depicting their struggle day to day both day to day struggle as also their anti japanese struggle so in this way a new type of culture developed which mao called a, a new democratic culture and in fact mao developed a yenan forum he wrote an article on yenan forum on literature and art uh, where he was he dealt with various problems about the uh, creation of a new culture in course of participation in the revolutionary struggle production movement of 1943 in 1942 the cpc made a frontal attack on rural poverty in a bordering region the campaigns for administrative reform reduction in rent led to the formation of large scale participation in mutual aid groups mutual aid groups among the peasants and these subsequently became the nucleus new forms of social and political life in the base areas and these in turn contribute contributed to the growth of rural cooperatives and the production movement of 1943 the aim of the cpc was to set up a self sufficient and prosperous economy that would cater to the needs of the people to the interests of the people improve their living conditions on cooperative basis and this was known as a production war and a number of innovations were attempted during that period and the most important of which was the organizational production now it was made clear that all the persons whether he was a party person irrespective of his rank or a red army or, or a soldier or peasant association member or any other person an administrator administrative official all of them would have to take part in production and in fact in edgar snow's book register over china there is a mention of saturday brigades saturday brigades means that every saturday all the people starting from mao right down to the cadet they would have to take part in physical labor they would devote some time some hours of the day to doing physical labor to do productive work now by so doing again the gap between the leader and the led between the cadet and the people that got reduced to a large extent and a sense of solidarity develops among them it strengthens solidarity uh, among those people between the leaders and the people between the cadre and the people between the army and the civilians and uh, through the unification of mental and physical labor during the same period there was a senior cadres conference and there mao advocated in the virtual absence of capital 
a labor intensive development program. It was a new model of development. We have a new developmental model, unlike the Western model of development. And that new model of development involved the mobilization of the people at the rural sector. All the material and human resources were to be channelized, uh, were to be utilized to the best possible extent, uh, and their physical efforts were channelized into cooperative ventures. Now, while proposing this labor-intensive development program, Mao had to fight against two deviations. There were two important deviations that cropped up. Now, one section within the party uh, believed that in such backward countries, such as the Chinese countryside, there could hardly be any economic development. It was not possible to initiate any development program in the countryside of China because it is simply backward. So that was one deviation. And the other deviation was the view that all resources should be immediately channelized into the development of heavy industry and not into that of agriculture and light industry. Mao naturally had to fight against both these deviations. And he pointed out that, of course, developmental work was possible in backward areas. Of course, uh, in the initial stage, we'll have to see to the development of agriculture and light industry because the people, overwhelming majority of the people, depend on these two sectors, light industry and agriculture. So Mao had to fight against these two deviations and successfully fought against this. One of the most difficult tasks faced by the CPC was to form the mutual aid groups and the cooperatives. Landed estates of the feudal lords, these were confiscated and distributed among the, among the peasants. But uh, distribution of land among the peasants was also, also implies that there was a creation of a new form of private proprietorship. Character was different, no doubt. Land to the tiller program, meaning land belongs to the tiller. So the tiller becomes a proprietor of the land, which was not the case. In the earlier period, it was under the control of the landlords, not the peasants. But the aim of the Communist Party was to, uh, was to create a society where there will be no private property. But it should go through stages. It cannot, there could be no state jumping. So mutual aid groups, that is, which we have already talked about, mutual aid groups were formed. Uh, embracing more and more people to cultivate collectively the same soil. Then the cooperatives were formed. Next one, that is educational and social change. The political and economic innovations initiated in Yunnan were also closely connected with a broad vision of development, rural development. And the main aim of the CPC was to create local institutions, local institutions by the people for the people. It's a new concept known as a min pan concept. And it this min pan institutions embraced the countryside during the Yunnan phase. It was also reflected in the in the field of education. In fact, min pan schools were opened in 1944 to meet the growing demand for education. Uh, schools were opened, night schools were opened, where, where peasants for the first time uh, learned how to read and write, how to study political uh, texts, uh, philosophy, a bit of history, geography, etc. And uh, the principles of community responsibility, which was highlighted by Mao time and time and again, particularly the propagation of the fundamentals of health and hygiene. Health and hygiene was a very neglected field. And Mao time and again emphasized this problem in his writings. So these things were there. Uh, folk songs and dances uh, were redesigned and combined with dramatic programs to expose the social evils, uh, to propagate the virtues of the new democratic society. So all these were done during that period. Uh, another aspect of the Yunnan phase important, and that is a mass line. The Cheng Feng movement also created a broad vision of man and society in revolution. And the principle of mass line was applied to explain the relationship between the leaders and the people. It was in June 1943 that uh, Mao, in a meeting of the Politburo, uh, elaborated his classic statement on mass line principles in his article, The Matters of Leadership. He says that uh, there should be a linking of the leadership with the masses 
and there should be a linking of the general with the specific. Uh, the general principle is based on the study of particulars, particular areas. There are many particular areas and the leadership of the party makes an analysis, a summing up of the particular areas and arrives at a general conclusion. But then, so we have a theory, we have a guideline, general guideline. But when that general guideline had to be implemented also in particular areas, and when it went to the particular areas, then it also might need modification, revision, because each particular area has its own particularity. So in order to uh, respond to that particularity or specificity, so there should be a linking of the general with the particular. So it starts from the particular, comes to the general, and from general back to the particular. And it's a process, ongoing process. It never ends. This is one thing. And other is the linking of the leadership with the masses. Of course, the leaders are, they are expected to guide the people, but they should also be guided by the people themselves because they come from the people through struggle and they should always go back to the people to share their experiences with them and the leadership would also have to learn from the people all the time. So it, it is also never ending. The relationship between leader and the people, between the people and the leader is also never ending. So these things were explained in his, uh, uh, in his article, The Methods of Leadership. And in fact, during the period also, uh, new values of life also uh, developed. Uh, there was a creation of a new society and along with it, there was a creation of new values also. It was the idea of a new society which, uh, which would put human values over everything else, which would not go for uh, profits as was the case in the Western capitalist world. But it would see to the interest, genuine interest of the people. It was a very much a pro-people model of development and not a profit-making model of development. Seventh Congress of the CPC. It was held in 1945 in Yenan. 17 years after the Sixth Congress was held in Moscow in 1928. And Mao Tung described it as a Congress of victories. By the time of the Seventh Congress, Mao's ideological authority had already been established. Mao's thought had already come to be introduced uh, in the political circles throughout the country. And the membership of the party, the membership of the Red Army, increased to a large extent. And uh, the CPC had, had got transformed from a national force into an international force. That brings us to the last phase, that is the Liberation War. After the Japanese surrendered, the second the anti-Japanese struggle was over. So there was no more, uh, no more need for the second United Front because now back to the same situation, war against Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang. That continued from 1945 to 1949 and it ended uh, in the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek. He fled to Taiwan. And on 1st October 1949, the People's Republic of China was proclaimed by Mao. And its proclamation marked the end of the anti-imperialist, anti-feudal struggle, uh, the attainment of the new democratic revolution, and the setting up of the People's Republic of China. And uh, that led to the next stage, that is the stage of socialist revolution. So you told that uh, mass lines linked the general with the specific. Can you please elaborate this statement? Whenever you study any situation, you start with a particular area. And, the, and then you make studies of many particular areas. And after that, you make a summing up and then come to a, a conclusion, a general, you can generalize. You can generalize only after summing up the experiences of different particular conditions. So then you form a theory about that area or the, the region, the larger area. But you will have to go back again to particular areas 
either those areas or new areas. And, and it, it might happen that you will have to change your conclusion. You might have to revise, modify your statements. So, so it's a process. So you start from the particular, come to the general, and then go back to the particular again, and then come to the, back to the general again. Because in course of doing this, this general particular, general specific, etc., you are gaining in knowledge. Same is true for the Communist Party. They are making the study way particular. As for example, when Mao just joined the Communist Party, he knew some areas of Hunan and nothing else. He, may, he made studies of Hunan, not all. Hunan is a very vast province. He made studies of the province and then he got an idea and then he went back to Hunan again, other areas. So in this way, in this way you widen your knowledge and you have to widen your knowledge only by implement, by going into practice. You must take part in this process physically. If you stop it, then there is a stop. You are, you are putting a halt to your knowledge gaining. So this is very important. So from general to specific, specific to general or particular. Now the period from the first half of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century was a period which witnessed the transformation of China from a feudal country into a semi-feudal and semi-colonial country and then a colony of Japan alone. The people of China carried forward their anti-feudal, anti-imperialist struggle and then their, and their national liberation war against Japanese aggression and they ultimately snatched victory. Uh, first defeated Japanese and then defeated Chiang Kai-shek. And so uh, foreign imperialist control and feudal exploitation became things of the past. And throughout this transitional period, from a semi-feudal, semi-colonial country to a new democratic China, and then to socialist China, Mao Zedong emerged as the friend, philosopher, guide, and the leader of the Chinese people. major setbacks and that was followed by the adoption of mass line which again of which again Mao was the architect. Now from the beginning of 1940 the whole of North China was faced with terrible military and economic crisis. The whole area the insurgent base area these were blockaded by the Japanese troops. And it was very difficult to get salt and other essential goods from outside there was scarcity of essential goods inside the base areas. And a time came when uh, people started to feel whether such revolution would at all be successful. So there was faltering within the ranks of the CPC. And there were also criticism of the policy of the new democratic revolution. Uh, and that came also from inside the party. And at that critical juncture, Mao initiated the rectification movement, which is also known in Chinese as a Cheng Feng movement. And the period was 1942 to 1944. Now the Cheng Feng movement essentially
in the course of its rise, the Chinese communists had to absorb three major defeats. And each of these setbacks ultimately led to radical innovations uh, in its approach to the revolution, in its approach to the war. And uh, in each of these defeats, Mao eventually emerged victorious as a leading architect of the new line. The first setback came in 1927 when there was a massacre of the Chinese communists and that was followed by the uh, end of the first united front. After that, there was the, the Mao adopted the policy of the uh, uh, agrarian revolution. The second defeat came after the destruction of the Kiangxi Soviet uh, on the Qingkangshan mountain. That led to the Long March, of course, and the Chinese party realized the need for anti-Japanese war. And the third uh, setback came uh, while they had been fighting the Japanese during the anti-Japanese war. There really was a uh, cadre training program. It marked a turning point in the history of the Chinese Communist movement. In fact, the main aim of the Cheng Feng was to build the Chinese Communist Party on a unified basis, committed to common goals, common aims, and common methods. It was a Marxist movement, no doubt. But side by side, the emphasis was on the creative application of Marxism to the concrete situation in China, rather than any mechanical application of it. You should have the party emphasize the fact that it should be not applied mechanically, but it should be applied in a creative manner. Now, one of the fundamental aspects of Mao Zedong thought was the belief that men could transcend the limitations of class. If a person came from middle class background, when he went to the countryside to integrate uh, himself with the, uh, himself or herself with the peasantry, then in course of social practice, in course of, the, of his integration with the people living in the villages, he gets declassed, he remolds his outlook, and he transcends the limitations of his own class. Now, uh, that was, of course, uh, uh, one major uh, object which Mao had in his mind during this period. And as a matter of fact, uh, the situation was very grave from the point of view of revolution because there were attacks from all sides and every day there were many casualties, many people died. And so the pressures from the enemy increased with every passing day. And there was, of course, a tendency to waver, tendency to capitulate before the enemy. So these tendencies were there. Now, the aim of this Cheng Feng movement was to strengthen the party cadres so that uh, 